experience. It's a very difficult word to define. Some people say one should have experience and not philosophy. Some people think that the proof of philosophy lies in experience. We look for experience when we are not sure of the knowledge we get in books or from lectures. It is said that knowledge of the sweetness of sugar is quite different from the experience of the sweetness of sugar. When we talk of experience, what does it mean? If I imagine what is the taste of sugar or sweetness of sugar, is it experience? If it is not, what is it? There was a time when the status of a person in society in this country, United States, was determined by what kind of entertainment he could arrange for himself. Those who went to theatres, live shows, or cinema were considered to be better off. They could afford to entertain themselves. Gradually, the theatre and cinema was outmoded because you could see it on the television at home. You didn't have to go anywhere. So the status symbol was whether you could have a color TV, what size, whether you have video tapes, your own tapes, and so on. The standard changed. Lately, the very nature of experience through theater and means of entertainment has changed. And now, people are willing to pay a price for getting experience of the most unusual kind in order to amuse themselves. And the word experience is being used by those people in that sense. For instance, a person who takes drugs or LSD or anything else, grass, when he gets a kick out of it, he calls it experience. All this philosophy and lectures he dismisses as no good. When a yogi talks of having to do meditation in order to get realization, the man with the little pill says, that's no good. I have the capsule of experience. I just take it, I get the experience. He only gets the philosophy. What's the meaning of experience? What is happening now? Is it experience? If we can really understand what is experience, we'll understand a lot about everything. One thing is obvious, that all experience requires an experiencer. That is obvious. Whatever definition you give to experience, all experience requires one who gets the experience. An experiencer is necessary. We have heard of experiences which are so common that we don't call them experiences. For example, the experience of breathing, air. When I ask people to tell me their most interesting experiences, nobody tells me about this. Nobody. And yet, if he doesn't breathe, he dies. Which is very survival. It's not called experience. On the other hand, if a person can see a glow of light when he closes his eyes, experience. Very, it is very strange that the very survival of the being is dependent on breathing and we don't call it experience and you see a little glow of light, maybe you are pressing your eyes a little bit, your eyeballs a little bit, it's called experience. In metaphysics and uh, in mysticism, the word experience has been used very often because it has been emphasized that unless you have experience, you have no realization. That is why people look out for experience. The confusion is created when people say, have experience of within. What is within you? Leave the experience of the world outside. That people want to have experience of within and they can't find any within. Because there is no within. What does within mean? Experience within, within oneself. If you say within yourself is in the head, 
you get into the head, close your eyes and get into the head, see the darkness around you. That darkness around you within the head is outside of yourself within the head. What is within? Whoever had experience within himself, nobody. Yet we find people claiming this guy is a realized one, he had experience within. Experience has always been out. The moment it is experience, it has to be outside. How can experience be within? Yes, the experiencer can be within. The one who is receiving the experience, the one who knows this is experience, can be inside. Not experience. Therefore, a subject like this, the ultimate experience, starts with difficulties. Because we don't know what experience is. Let us give the most general meaning to the word experience and try and understand it. Let us assume that whatever comes to our knowledge comes within our perception, comes within our thoughts, comes within our consciousness, comes within our awareness, may be called experience. Whatever happens to make us conscious of something, let us give that wide definition, is experience. Then if consciousness of a human being becomes conscious of anything, let's call it experience and analyze what kind of experiences we have. We have experiences of a large variety of energies in the physical system. The physical system is the one where we perceive a physical world with this physical body. The most common experiences that arise from the physical body in the physical world are through five sense perceptions. Seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, hearing. These five experiences of the world constitute the world for us. Most of us know the world only through these five senses. These sense perceptions tell us this is the world. And what they tell us is the experience of the world. If I see a thing with my eyes, I have experienced that thing with my eyes. The whole world is then coming into me through these sense perceptions. While I am still in the physical world, I am using, besides these five perceptive apparatuses, perceptive devices, devices of perception, I am also using six energy centers. These energy centers are creating a pattern in which the experience can be placed. I have the energy center at the throat, which gives me the power to imagine the thing which I don't see, which is not there. Which gives me the power to go to sleep and still have experience without things being there in the form of a dream. It's energy. Energy is there in the whole body, but the energy, when it operates at the throat center, give this power. There is the energy at the heart center which creates and destroys all experience. I can activate the energy center in the heart and I can have an experience which is not seen otherwise. For example, by activating the heart center of energy, I can see the oneness of two people merging, which I can't see otherwise. If I want to see how two people, Professor Mueller and I, if we are one, without the senses, I can only imagine how they can be one. By activating the heart center of energy, I can see the merger. And we actually merge. This experience is possible by activating the heart center. The navel center, the center of reproduction and the rectal center. These are the lower centers, the 
rectal center gives me the gravity and stability gives me a direction otherwise how do i know i am upside down my wife is standing on this earth at this time with her head exactly in the opposite direction in which i am standing she is at this time cooking breakfast in india i spoke to her the other day that's what she was doing and she was upside down <laughs> in fact exactly in the opposite direction we both think we are straight <laughs> it's nothing more than an experience we are perceiving nothing there is no perception involved none of the five senses of perception are being used but an energy center the lowest energy center is being used and we both think we are up straight up our heads are up and our feet are down of course our heads are up and feet are down in relation to the earth the gravity the relationship of the body with the gravity causing a sense of direction is being created by use of a certain energy center it's an experience the center of reproduction is called the center of beginning of time if you want to say when did this begin it is that energy center operating when it all began it's an experience you don't see it at one time in the beginning was this look at the concept all our stories which we tell all fairy tales everything including two stories have once upon a time it all began how does it begin supposing time actually is a is a complete circle and there is no beginning which indeed is the truth it has no beginning we must give it a beginning how do we give it how do we give beginning to an event to the energy center and we call it the energy center of brahma the creator it creates because it begins the result is every event through perception gets jammed in this energy center and there is a beginning you can always trace a beginning people say all right right in the beginning what was god to me even when i talk of the higher levels of consciousness and say there is a state beyond time beyond beginnings the timelessness the ultimate consciousness cosmic consciousness resides i was talking yesterday people still ask me what was cosmic consciousness doing right in the beginning but there was no beginning when there was no time this energy center created the experience of beginning it's not a experience of perception at all the energy center in the navel of the human body creates the feeling of sustenance this will go on and on and on the heart center which merges destroys part of experience we call it the center of vishnu and the center of shiva there is a trinity of gods in indian mythology brahma vishnu shiva brahma the creator vishnu the sustainer shiva the destroyer and these are symbols to show that all experience through these energy centers can be given the shape of a beginning a middle and an end it's only use of energy energy centers give this shape to experience which is experience you can have experience of beginning of middle and of end you can have the experience from the shakti center the throat of creating without perception and finally you can have the experience of the self the experiencer at the eye center these six centers have been used in all oriental yoga for self realization that is the yoga of the energy centers the yoga of the six energy centers has given this kind of experience when people tried with mexican mushrooms the two harvard professors were trying mexican mushrooms i was there i met both of them there timothy leary as well as richard alpert baba ramdas they were both professors in that year they were expelled from the university the same year when i was there these students were discussing this very subject with me at that time in 1963 62 when i was there at that time when they took mushrooms and they found that it created the same feeling which you could create by yogic practice at the heart center they discussed
discovered that these were physical energy centers. And they could be activated chemically or by yoga. There was so much syllabaloo about the supernatural experience, mystic experience, higher experience. This is nothing but the experience of the energy centers. I am today using the word energy they did not use yesterday. Yesterday I was talking of con cosmic consciousness. And I never referred to the six centers in the physical body. Because this six centers do not constitute consciousness. They are energy centers which puts consciousness in a certain frame of experience. You can have very unusual experiences. I said we don't notice breathing, although our survival depends on it. But we notice the most ordinary thing that does not follow the laws of nature. We are looking for proof and miracles in anything that happens that does not follow the laws of nature. The greatest tragedy of a human being. That he cannot see a miracle if it takes place within the laws of nature, but will immediately jump to the conclusion he has seen a miracle if the law of nature is defied. If a person is thrown from here and falls to the ground, it is no miracle. If he is thrown here and he goes up, it's a miracle. Why? Because gravity should pull him down. The laws of nature are being used for experience at a particular level, physical level. Now, I have only told you about the energy centers and the perceptions which function in the physical body. In the physical body itself functions the physical mind. Yesterday, I did not tell you that the mind functions physically also. I drew a very neat diagram. I didn't want to confuse you. Neat diagram. Physical is only these senses of perception. Astral, senses without body. Causal, mental, mind alone. About that, spiritual. I did not want to confuse you that the mind is there even at the physical level. Why you think when you are in the body? <laughs> you have gone nowhere, it's the body. You still identify yourself with the body and think. And that mind which is in the body is called body mind, physical mind. We call it the Pindi man. Pindi means the one that's confined to the body. The mind that is confined to the body. It thinks differently from the mind that is not confined in the body. The experience of the mind confined in the body is different from the experience of the mind not so confined. Therefore, you do not get to know the mind only by getting a release from the body and the senses. You get an experience of the mind with the body and the senses. When the mind thinks in the body, it thinks in relation to what is true with the body. This whole world around us that we see is created by the body. Nothing has been created which is not created by this body. If you take your body away, who is there? You are related to nobody. The relations which create problems for us. Day and night I speak to people, look, stop thinking. Thinking is giving all the problems to you. Stop thinking, stop thinking. You don't have to think so much. Rely on intuition, rely on your hunch. Rely on love, rely on something else, rely on circumstances, rely on coincidences. They are better than thinking. I keep on saying this. But why should thinking become such a problem? Thinking should be a beautiful thing. You can pump in any thoughts, beautiful thoughts. Why don't you see the beauty of thought? The reason is because we think of things to which we are related with the body. All the problems that have arisen in thinking have arisen because of the body. Now what are those things? Wife? Whose wife? Supposing I say, my wife is a problem. I don't realize, till I think over it, till I contemplate, she's not my wife, she's the wife of this body. If I am consciousness per se, using this body, that consciousness per se is not married. The wife, this body is. If I took my consciousness from this body and put it into Bob Parker's body and took his out and made it wait for a while, 
The wife will not become his, will still be this bodies. These are my children, my son and my daughter. Whose son and daughter? My bodies. This is my property. I own it. I got a title on it. Who has got the title? The body. The living conscious self in the body doesn't own anything. Examine what are the problems that come through thinking and all of them arise because of the body. It is the mind in the body that creates problems. It's the thoughts which identify themselves with the body that create problems, not thoughts per se. Thinking is a good thing if you think other than through the physical mind. The first time I think I am putting in a word in favor of the mind. The mind is not such a bad guy after all. But the mind in the body creates problems because we have created all our relationships which create problems through the physical body. All relationships are through the physical body. You look back, analyze what are the problems you have faced. I talk to people, I talk of problems in my counseling sessions every day. Not a single problem has ever been brought to my notice. It does not arise from the body. Isn't it strange? And we have so much in us besides the body. Not a single thought has bothered a person except when it identifies itself with the body. The experience of the physical world with the physical body is the only problem area in this world. Is the only ugly part in this world. The rest is beautiful. So when we talk of ugly and bad experiences, they are all relatable to experience of the mind in the body. The pendy mind. The physical mind. When the mind is released from the body, it functions differently. Consciousness percolates down through attention into the energy centers and through the energy centers into the rest of the body and through the body into all these so-called relationships. The experience is picked up by attention flowing through the system. There is no experience possible if it is not picked up by attention through the system. The whole world can exist around you. If your attention is not there, the world is not. We are picking up this world through attention flowing through a system. And this energy also is useless unless attention flows through the energy. We create energy fields through the six centers. The more you concentrate there, the more you concentrate energy fields. That concentration is also through attention. If somebody wants to concentrate at the heart center, which is a very popular center for yogic practice, the Kundalini Yoga, they start in the six centers and at the second, third and fourth centers, the reversal of the Kundalini energy flow takes place and gives you the most unusual experiences. If one does that, one is using the same attention, the flow of attention through the centers in this particular direction. What I am saying is not a theoretical concept, it is what the yogis do. Yoga means to go through the energy centers and identify yourself. The yogis start from the lowest center which gives them a sense of direction and travel upwards. Unless they start from the Ganesh center, the center of God Ganesh at the bottom, they can't travel upwards. There is no upwards. Sometimes it is called the gate of the temple when you go inside the temple is. And as you move upwards, you create beginnings, middles and ends. Then you create all the power, the power of imagining, the power of creating at the center. And then you come up to the center from where you started and you say, that's me. I found myself out. That was me. That's the yogic practice. I have seen yogis performing all the yogic practice and reaching the highest level of experience. Experience, they call it, of the self at this center behind the eyes from where they started the yogic practice. Anyway. They have gone through the experience of energy centers and to the process of attention. They have gathered that experience of center by center and after seeing all those unusual things have landed up from where they started and said we have found ourselves. In fact, this was no great experience. It was unusual. 
an unusual experience is not a very great experience. So what have you found? If you see distorted mirrors with odd surfaces, you see yourself in a very odd shape and form. It looks very funny when you see it. But it's, you know it's just the same self being seen in a distorted form. Not a great experience. It's just distorted. All experiences up to the center in the energy centers below are distorted, changed, modified, made unusual by the energy whirlpool that we create at different centers. But experience is not great. It's just the same self being seen in a, in a distorted mirror. On the other hand, now starts the real experience from the eye center above, or rather behind the eye center. These centers, which I have described, these six centers, are characterized by a setup in which if you actually put all your attention in each of the centers and move upwards, you will find there is a light and there is a structure of the organism within. And the energy flow takes up certain forms which have been described as lotus petals. The old yogis have described them as lotus petals because the light flows in certain rays from these centers. The glow of the centers makes it look like it's a flower with a number of petals. Starting from four at the bottom, goes on multiplying. This uh, cycle should start at two. It in fact starts at two, but we jump to four at the bottom and again come up. The two being the two eyes. And we call it the two petal lotus. In the lower center we call the four petal lotus, the six petal lotus, the eight petal lotus. We go on increasing the number of petals and we come back to the two petal lotus, the eyes. Then again the cycle starts. Behind the eyes, if, if my two fingers, the end of the fingers represent the eyes, and this is the structure where the two fingers are meeting, at approximately the same area in the head. If we take our attention to that point, then midway in the two fingers, at this point, we find a four petal growth. If we try and put our attention behind the eyes, we will see the four petal growth. Now, people close their eyes and they say we are behind the eyes. We don't see any lotus. The reason why you don't see a lotus when you close your eyes is because you're not behind the eyes. You're still in front of the eyes. You close your eyes. You can't see what is in front. That doesn't become behind the eyes. If somebody is confused about it, you can do a little experiment. I have made people sit next to me and say, all right, you want to have a feel of what it is like to be behind the eyes? Get behind the eyes. Close your eyes. Now, are you behind the eyes? Yes, and now I can see myself just behind the eyes. The eyes are in front of me. Then I say, all right, now let's conduct a test where you are. With your eyes open, take these hands up, touch the eyes, bring them back, so that you have a, an idea how far these hands go in order to touch the eyes. You take these hands and they touch them. So then you can know that even if you take it here, you know where it will stop if the eyes will come. But that much of distance your hands can travel. When they travel up to the eyes, then you take it down, close the eyes and see where you are sitting behind the eyes and then bring them up slowly. And when you are very close to where you are sitting, just tell us. So when they bring it just outside the eyes, they say, oh, we just touched where we are sitting. We just crossed it. You can do it now. You will find the result. You are not sitting inside, behind the eyes. You are sitting in front of the eyes. In the darkness created by shutting the eyes. We shut our eyes and see darkness and we say that's inside. It's all outside. We are seeing with nothing but trying to see with these very eyes. They can't see because we have shut them. How can we see? And the image we make of ourselves sitting behind the eyes is being made outside these eyes just in front. The more we press behind the eyes, the closer it comes to somewhere outside the eyes. Not inside. If it was inside, you would see the lotus. How can you see the lotus outside? It's all dark. It's dark because you close your eyes. Open them, you will see. These physical eyes. Therefore, if you could withdraw your attention, your attention, you see again with the attention. The image of our self which we created in the darkness by closing our eyes is created by attention. We are putting our attention there. Thinking about that place and that creates the attention there. 
if we could really withdraw the attention to behind the eyes, then there's a technology for doing it. There's a method. And one ought to learn the method if one is interested in this. Then you would find the four petal lotus just behind the eyes, which gives you the power instantly of defying all the laws of beginning, middle, and end that you were using in the energy centers, such as you could sit here and see what's happening in the room there. You have gone nowhere, just behind the eyes. People talk of big spiritual journeys. When you journey, you can see through walls just by being at the four petal lotus behind the eyes. You have not gone to the point from where you are seeing. You haven't gone to the self. You haven't gone to what is called the third eye center behind the two eyes. The third eye center is here. You are here. This is the four petal lotus. The third eye center is still behind, in the middle of the head. Even by going to the center between the self center, center of consciousness, behind the eyes and the eyes, just traveling from the two petal lotus to the eye center in the middle, you get an amazing power of experience unknown in all the energy centers. It is not an experience of violation of the laws of nature. It's an experience of greater perception. You will see through the wall what's happening there, but you will see what is happening there. You will see precisely how it is happening there. When the body is released and consciousness moves away, along with the astral apparatus, which happens in death. This is what we can see. The other day, I was seeing a videotape of a program that came in Chicago television on reincarnation and on what happens after death. They listed a number of cases and prepared a film. A number of people who died and came back reported that they could see through things. They were somewhere from where they could see their own body. They could see through the wall. They were standing here. The doctor was there in the, where the body lay. They saw through the wall what was happening to the body. But why wait to die? To do this? You can do it now. Die while living. And it's not a very big thing. Just withdraw your attention and the eyes. And if you were to pull back yourself from there to the third eye center about which even Lord Jesus spoke, if thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. This body. If you pull your attention from the two eyes in which it is now residing behind to the four petal lotus and to the third eye center in the middle of the head, just below the pituitary gland. If you pull your attention to yourself at the third eye center, you get filled with light. People sometimes ask me, is it necessary to have a master to get all this experience? I say, yes, it is necessary. Because you don't know the direction at all. Who will tell you the direction? If we want to put our attention inside, we put it outside. If we want to go within, we put it outside. Who will tell us how to change the direction of attention except the master? We we'll keep on confusing ourselves. But then people say, we are not interested in this. We want to just worship God. Fine. We want to pray to God. That you can do. You don't need a master for that. For worship and prayer, you don't need a master. Anyone can worship. Anyone can pray. And I find when I'm traveling in a plane and we pass through a storm and the plane is in a very bad shape and they say there may be an accident, more than half the passengers are praying. We need this kind of a Stimulant for praying. We want the angel before we pray. What's this? I was talking to uh, a, a chairman of a big company in Canada. We were traveling in a plane. The plane was about to have all this trouble and we talked a prayer earlier. And he says, do you know I am now praying after a long time. Prayer and worship is quite different from realization. If you want to realize the self and realize God, Realize what is the meaning of experience. It's not prayer you want. You want experience. You can't equate prayer with experience. The other day I said, I read a nice thought about prayer which said, prayers must never be answered. Because if they are, they are no longer prayers but simple correspondence. There's no fun in praying and getting an answer back. So people keep on praying, they never get an answer. The same thing is true of worship. If you worship, you can't love. Worship can create awe, fear, 
admiration, but not love. You can worship God, but you cannot love God. You can love a human. Love requires communication, not words. These experiences come by going within to our own eye center. Going within means experiencer goes within. Experience still is outside. No experience is within. Let me make it clear. All experience is outside of the self. The self is within experience. The experience encloses the experiencer. The experiencer is within and the experience is outside. Whether it's of God or cosmic consciousness or here, then we are a human being. Whatever is seen is projected on the screen outside, not inside. There is nothing called inside. At the third eye center, when people talk of a master, who is a master? The master lives in the third eye center. The master who can give you this experience himself lives at the other end, not here. The master does not live in this world. The master I know of doesn't live here at all. People are still searching for him, going all over. The master lives inside us at the third eye center. In each one of us. The spiritual master who can reverse the direction of attention and take us back to the higher experience of the self, himself lives in the third eye center and has decided not to come out. But we never look for him there. Therefore, he has to create an image of himself outside. What can he do? We never search for him there. Nobody searches for the master there. Here again, you people, many of you have gone around the world hearing about masters, searching for a master. You find people talking of the master. To sustain the illusion of action and reaction, to sustain the illusion of karma, to sustain the basis of a pattern which creates this universe, to sustain the illusion of the body and all the relationships, to sustain the illusion of pain and pleasure, of war and peace, of everything that is happening by this illusion. This is the first great darkness in a spiritual journey. They talk of two great darknesses in the first great darkness, between here and the railroad station at the third eye center. First great darkness, difficult to go through. Because our will will not take us. We will look for the master outside. The second great darkness, the only two, is when we find our ultimate soul, of which I talked yesterday, which is individuated pure consciousness, with no mind, no senses, no body, and yet separated from the Lord because it has not experienced totality. The wall of individuation on totality is the second great darkness, only two great darknesses, the whole spiritual path. It is this particular experience of Going to the astral, radiant, real form of a master who initiates us at that point that constitutes effort. The rest is all grace. The experience of effort comes here. People say, do you get these results by effort or by grace? Is it the grace of the Lord that we can have it? Or do we have to make an effort? It is the grace of the Lord that we think of making an effort. So there is no difference in that. When we make effort, it's only by his grace. You won't make otherwise. What new thing happens one fine morning when we think of making an effort? We are the same people. Only the grace of the Lord has been added on to us. And we say, oh, my effort. Now I'm going to try and see how it works. But this illusion of our effort is what is the price to be paid for reaching the man. The rest of the journey is his responsibility. He's got all the arrangements, all documents, everything else. We have to do nothing after it, except enjoy a spiritual journey. Travel without the body, soul travel. You can have all that. Good fun after crossing this path. The initiation by a master also takes place. It's interesting to know what is the experience of initiation. Again, we are talking of experiences. What is meant by initiation? Now, we are not talking of uh, uh, phony ma master outside or yogi and others teaching you how to do various kinds of bodily postures and and uh, try and make the mind peaceful and give suggestions to you that all outwardly. No, I'm not talking of those masters. And the initiation and mantras and so on, I'm not talking of that. I am talking of initiation 
by the real master who changes your direction of attention to take you to the third eye center where he is sitting. How does he initiate you? What does he do at the third eye center which he calls initiation? He cuts off your mind's accountability through time. These mark my words. It's a very, it's a very unknown thing. What I'm saying today is not commonly said. A very few people have known what initiation is. Initiation is the process by which the master sitting in the third eye center within us, within each one of us, cuts off our accountability to time. We become no longer accountable to time. What becomes accountable to him? The mind continues to be the same. We don't know we are initiated. While we are still in the physical frame outside and having the same experiences, and if the master has initiated us within, we don't know we are initiated. What a sad thing a person can be initiated and not know he is initiated. In fact, none of us know we are initiated unless we reach the third eye center and see how our accountability to time has been cut. What is accountability to time? Accountability to time is what creates karma. If you are accountable to time, then you are accountable to what happened yesterday and today. And today. Then there is the process of what you sow, what you reap. This principle of what you sow, the same you will reap. This principle is based upon time and this itself is cut. People after initiation are worried about karma. Sometimes they don't know what they are worrying about. They don't know what initiation is. If they knew what initiation meant, they would not worry about karma at all if they were initiated by a master of third eye sight. The experience of initiation is realized by reaching the third eye center, by withdrawal of attention to that center. It's a grand experience. But the master has projected himself into an image outside. That means taken up a form like ourselves outside to give the message to go to the place where he is. Why does he take a form like us? He should look a little different so one can recognize from a distance. There's a master, let's check with him. Now, is it right? Time is right, we want to go in with him. But he doesn't. He doesn't take any extraordinary form like a giant or some piece of light. Of course, if there's light, we can talk to it. Maybe this light master, we can talk to it. If it is a giant, we'll be frightened of it. If it's sitting on a pedestal, we worship and admire it. We can't uh, accept accept a master unless it is unless he is like us. Even God cannot draw us towards the master unless he is like us. There is a very interesting master from Iran who has written in one of his poems that he is given a story. Most of these uh, things have to be put into the form of parable story so we can understand them. It becomes very difficult otherwise this conversation like that <laughs> you were mentioning the other day. They have to be put into a story form. He says there is a story of a of a little child who is playing with his mother. And the child runs up to the top of a house which has no walls on the sides, just a plain flat roof of the, of the house. And he climbs the staircase and goes up there. And the mother is afraid this child will fall down. So the mother runs after the child. He says, stop it. This is no game. You are going to fall. And the child laughs. Boisterously, oh mom, come and catch me. Now you catch me. He thinks it's a game. The more serious she becomes, the more he laughs. He knows he's feeling his mother. And he goes to the edge of the roof. Now the mother is afraid. Every step she takes to take the child makes him go to the edge and he's now fall. When she tries to engage him in conversation and takes a step, there's a little drain pipe. Take the water off the roof, jetting out. The child jumps on the pipe and holds on to the edge. Now the mother says there's no chance. Even if I do nothing, he'll fall after a while. So she's a terrible thing. Watching the child telling him to come back, he's still laughing, thinking it's a big game. He doesn't recognize that there is danger of his falling, hurting himself. He plays a big game, the mother is worried, she calls him, he does not come back. This is the situation. Then a man comes by, a passer by, he looks at the situation, he says, ma'am, what's your problem? You look very worried. And the mother says, I am worried. Look at my child. I tried to call him back. He's bound to fall from there. He's not listening. And that man on the side says, Oh, I solved the problem. Come down. 
It was your child, yes, come down. Many times that lady, don't you have any other children in your neighborhood? She says, yes, there is a child just right there. You bring a child of the same age as your son. And she quickly runs and brings the child of the neighbor. Then he says, give this child a toy in his hand and put him on the roof. Don't look at your child. Ignore him. Just give a toy to this child, the neighbor, put him on the roof. She takes the child, gives a toy, puts him on the roof. When this little fellow hanging on the pipe notices the other child with the toy, he crawls back. Comes the child of the mother. Molana Rumi, who has written this story, he says, Man who is facing this danger of remaining perilously hanging outside his third eye center, or where he will fall into this world, is being called back by his mother the God. Come back, listen to me. He thinks it's a game. The television stations, just his temples, they're all shouting at man. Come back and he doesn't listen. This is a big game. Don't take it seriously. The only way this child, this man can go back is if somebody like him come with a toy in his hand. Therefore, even if God himself were to come, if master were to come to draw the attention of this man, man child, grown up human child, back, he must come in the same form, just like us. A master must appear here just like us. With the only difference, he should hold a toy in his hand to attract us. Yes. And that's what masters do. The image of the master outside is exactly like us, except carrying a little toy of a bit of love and affection for us, which draws us. And then the master, the third eye center, can pick us. That is why you can love a master which is the only path towards self-realization. If he is exactly in our form and offers love, if he offers anything else, you can have any other feeling. Worship, admiration, awe, fear, but not love. He should be just like us. Little toy of love, which he show us and then try and run away. We play. But then, if he has taken a form like us, that should be an identification for us to recognize him at the third eye center. At the third eye center, he sits exactly in that form in which he appears in the image outside, like us. That is how we find him. When we withdraw our attention between the eyes to the third eye center and we are filled with light, the light shines from the same master whom we have seen outside with the same face, same appearance, as we saw him outside, but ready in the of life. It's a great experience. I tell you one of the greatest experiences on the spiritual discipline and the path of realization is the experience of meeting the real radiant form of the master within. And this experience of meeting the radiant form intensifies our love for the form we saw outside. Because we suddenly discover it's the same. That this was not like us. That was a big game being played upon us. So once we have found the real master, we find out we were initiated. And when? When that master had cut our connection with this time, had cut our accountability, cut the accountability of our consciousness loaded with the physical mind from time. Therefore, since he is cutting our accountability to time, he will not guarantee time for anything. That's a big difference between a master and a magician sitting outside. The master, miracles will be not dependent upon any time frame. If somebody asks the master, when will this happen? Three months? Let us see. Because if he says three months, he is subjecting himself and his disciples to a time frame of whom he has released them already by initiation. He will make no commitment on time. He will make commitment on everything else. This is a remarkable arrangement. Looks very ordinary that the accountability to time is cut off, but the fact of the matter is 
It's accountability to the whole system, the whole illusion of karma that is cut off. The whole cycle of birth and rebirth, reincarnation, in which we have now begun to have so much belief, is dependent upon the accountability to time. If there is no accountability to time, there is no reincarnation. It's one of the greatest things that has ever happened to anybody to be initiated by the real man of the third eye center. Imagine the experience of this center within. From that center, the experience ascends through all the levels of awareness, of consciousness, which they spoke of yesterday, with the master leading us through those experiences. Every experience is outside of the self at every level. At the astral level, from the third eye center onwards, we can see visual experience of a world that has created this world. We see a world of much larger space than this world. Not Earth no, Earth only. The entire universe. Much larger space. We travel <coughs> the energy of thought, not the energy of oil and electricity. We communicate the energy of telepathy, not the energy of words and telephones. When one rises to that level of awareness with the master for the first time, first time means after a long time. One feels it is so new. One is not used to it. Here we are used to speaking with each other with words. So we continue to use words there also. In the radio, of our appearances are so full of light. We talk to each other with words. We suddenly find, before we have used the words, the other person has understood. Then suddenly we realize that it is by thoughts we are talking to each other. The normal means of communication in the world of the astral level of experience, astral level of consciousness, which is seen outside of ourselves and third eye center. The whole world that is created, the normal means of conversation there is telepathy, of which some accidental evidence comes down to the physical level. But there is a normal. We get used to it after a while. This one little Change in the nature of experience makes all the nature change in relationship. Do you know all the problems here between human beings are arising because we can't raise their thought? We don't know what they are thinking about, therefore they are problems. If we could read the thoughts of everybody here, problems would disappear. It would think differently. Imagine an actual region, a world in which we travel, in which we move about and meet people. A beautiful place, that experience. All patterns that you see here are derived from there. There are homes there, there are buildings there, there are structures constructed. In patterns and designs, this earth could not know for the next 2000 years. You can see them now. Here, we go to a library in the university to take out a book. Why? Because a book contains knowledge on a particular subject gathered over a period of time. There you have library, the diastole region. Let me, I'm talking of the nature of experience, some differences in the experience. There you can have an experience of visiting a library of experience. Draw out the experience, not the knowledge recorded on paper, the experience itself, relive it of what happened in the last 2000 years. It's stored there, you can pull it out, people are doing it. There's a huge population doing it. It's a beautiful place. All the hells and heavens we have spoken of are there. You can visit them. Through astral soul travel, people are visiting them. All it requires is to withdraw the attention to third eye center, get a ticket from the master who goes along with you, travel. This whole experience of the great beauty, where you can move at the speed of thought, not at the speed of light. We are restricted in the physical plane, the physical body, with physical particles of matter, with physical energy, with physical mind, to travel at velocities which are very low, very slow. Velocity of 
of light. There are some velocities in this earth we don't know. These are people sitting here don't know anything faster than the velocity of light. And the very next step that the astral plane, that beautiful world, you travel at the velocity of thought million times, several million times faster than the velocity of light. You want to go to an outer galaxy to see what's happening? You want to see other Earth, other galaxies inhabited? You can travel as fast as you like and see them and come back. The same galaxies are seen here also. They are not different. You have seen them with power at the astral level which you don't have here. You release those powers so you can do all that. The knowledge of each other's minds makes living quite a free will yes. Because you can know everything. But not complete. You still feel you can have the will either to go this way or that way, either to go into the library or not, either to see the new tree which you want to grow. You can plant a tree now and see immediately how it bears fruit. It will grow immediately in one second. There are a lot of ex a strange experiences. Quite difficult to conceive while we are here. But you can rise above into the causal regions of which I spoke yesterday and see the experiences of all experiences stored at one place. Every experience of the past and the future is stored there. You can move forward and backward on experience. The time available there is such you can move into the past as far as you like. For anything, you are interested in seeing about this wood. You just have to look at it at the causal level. You will see, see personally experienced as it happened when it was being assembled. When you go and see, you will see the wood from which it is being cut. The best places where it was prepared. You go and see backward the root of the tree to where it grew. Everything can be personally seen. You just watch this and the whole drama. You go on. The longer you go, the more backward you go. You want to see a person. What were you in the past like? Watch him in the causal plane. Beautiful life. Everything is there. And you watch and you see everything about the person. All his previous incarnation. Depending upon how much time you have, how much amused you are, you keep on seeing. You want to see what will happen in the future? Turn the other way around and see. Everything that will happen in the future can be seen and experienced. What a terrific experience! We don't even know if we can use the word experience for this experience. Look at this guy taking little acids and drugs and thinking we're getting experience. I sometimes marvel. Have you ever heard of this experience? I talk to so many of them. Just getting an energy center kicked up and something unusual. And here you get access, direct access to all experience that has ever happened anywhere to anybody. It's all open there, it's within each one of us. And the master takes you and shows you. Enjoy, laughs and you also laugh. You've never seen this thing before. And he takes you through that experience. And doesn't let you see too much of it, of course. He is a perfect master. Now I refer to a perfect master, not a master. A perfect master is one who can transcend these regions right up the corner and go to the spiritual and total. Below that are not the perfect masters. Masters who can take us up to the second stage of the mind, the causal region, are not perfect. Those who take us beyond the mind are perfect. Even among the perfect masters, the gurus, we distinguish between a sub guru, the true guru, and the sad guru, the guru who has done practice. The true guru is one who goes to the totality. The sad guru is the one who goes to pure spirit, but with the veil of individuation. Both go beyond the mind, they are perfect man. Both of them. So this classification is irrelevant at this moment to us, but understand the nature of experience that they can give us. When we rise, with the Guru, with the Master, about the mind. Now, don't strain your intellect too much because what I am saying is intellectually not incapable of understanding. They take us into the region of the spirit where there is no time and no space and yet I would be legitimately using the word experiences still outside, outside the experiencer in timelessness and spacelessness. 
the experiencer and the experience are both together, but experience is still outside. It is being created outside by the experience. And the experience, if it is put in a time frame, what would it look like? It would look like the brightest ocean light, lovely islands. Each one of us has an island of creation. It will surprise you to know that each one of us right now has an island of creation. You can get onto your own island of creation at will. It is there. It is marked. It is a beautiful experience. You create what you like in your island. You travel from one island to another island. Beautiful space travel. Spaceless space travel. It is all in, in non-space. But you still have the experience outside. And that beauty of creations. Each one consists of billions of worlds. The challenge to this opinion of the world. They have got everything that you have ever thought of seeing. You can still rise higher. Pass the second great darkness and get into totality. Totality is a great thing. It's a merger of all experiences into one experience. And yet retaining the memory, retaining the experience of all experiences. Total experience. It's difficult to conceive, but that's the truth. All experience from now onwards till the end that I have spoken of is put into one capsule and is available to each one because each one becomes the same one in that region. The true region, where nothing changes, nothing can change because total experience is there. What can change? Total experience means all experience of past, present, future, all experience of time, timelessness, all experience of here and there, all experience of pairs of opposites and without pairs of opposites, all experience of individuation and totality. It's all in one spot called total consciousness. We can't change. That's the only unchanging thing in this entire universe, the entire regions of creation, the entire levels of consciousness. The only thing that has never changed is total consciousness, which includes total experience. My suggestion to you is this. I am putting forth to you that that is the ultimate experience. Your ultimate experience is the experience of totality. The experience in which all the experiences I have mentioned get all put together. It is from that experience of totality, of consciousness, from which we are getting the experience is what we are getting now. It is the illusion that we get part, because the total cannot be broken into part. The illusion can be created into the part. The total exists. The illusion of parts is created and we are having what we are having now and we keep on having right till we reach again. The illusion of reality of unchangeability which is total consciousness, total experience. And that's the ultimate experience. Thank you very much. Yes. Why would a person in this consciousness go and see the severing has been done, right, and see the master, and then not disavow it, but come back and start all over again. I don't mean this whole like I'm going to shut down over a small, a short period of time, or I see, or the fact the person recognizes it and still uh, in a form retreat. All that I have described can be seen by starting a journey in the body itself. While we are still confined in the cage, we can use the awareness of the cage and get that experience. Actually, we are activating the switches of consciousness still in the body. We never left the body. Within this body, you can have all the experiences I have spoken of. Therefore, why we come back is because we are still here. That's right. Otherwise, we don't. So it's an illusion that the person was with the master. It looks like it's illusion, but actually that's the reality. This is the illusion that we are like. The so flip flop. Yes. Now my question was quite similar to his, but it was a little different. And it's simply he was 
say why come back, I can understand why you would want this, why you would, why the need to come back is still in the body. But I would wonder why there's no control of the time by reincarnation. If one is able to go with them, get these experiences and be there, and uh, then to leave the physical form and to go to the uh, astral plane, to the higher plane, to be with the master, then why reincarnation? You don't need reincarnation. You're saying it doesn't have to take place. So it it doesn't have to. It, does it ever take place? No. It can take place. It's your will. You can't deny it. Your will to yourself. Okay. Well, Somebody wants to go into you and you can't stop it. One enjoys it. Once you know it's a fusion, you enjoy it. When you're taking it real, you're saying, why do you want to come back here? Because you're taking it real. So the moment you come to know it's a fusion, you feel like coming back to it and seeing and going back to reality again. Is there, is there a time frame? Is there, is there some type of time frame that exists on the astral plane uh, that is different from the physical plane? Yes, and there is a time frame. Yeah. I mentioned yesterday, that at the astral plane, there is a time frame which is unrelated to the time frame here. More of the time can fit, fit into it or less of the time can fit into it. So it can be expanded or It can reduced. be expanded, it can be contracted, it can be stopped. So the number of experiences are actually dependent upon the will of the master. Yes, when you see. that's right. Okay, my final question is, uh, if the soul then merges into the master, and this is the ultimate experience, why then loneliness? Because then the only the soul master, one consciousness remains. But the soul still holds all of these experiences, it still retains the experiences of, 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 of totality. Why the loneliness? If you are brought into good company and you have a nice time, and then you're sent out alone on an island, sitting alone, remembering everything, won't you be lonely? If you go to that island and are all alone, but you remember all the company you had here, won't you be alone and lonely? But I would, would not. Uh, would you would you regard the memory of I would I would be as thinking, good as company because that would be my mind that would be thinking about about the, about these people though. And, but if I was aware that all of these people were were just experiences and then why 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 oh well, I say okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you became aware that these were only experiences, okay. you would become lonely. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yes. No, that's how astral travel. There's a that's a state of consciousness lower than the physical body. It's at the level, astral travel that I spoke of, in relation to the physical body, is situated at the third eye center behind the eye. The dream state in the sleep is at the throat center. The deep sleep when we don't remember a dream is at the heart center. The attention of consciousness descends to the center of the sleep. It goes behind the eye and above during astral travel. Yes. Yes. When you get to the eye center, you get out of the physics. And then you are between the eyes and the eye center, you see this universe with much more faculty. No difference. You can go either way. But let me uh, clear a little confusion about time and space. But you say space is available. Time frame is different. What is space? I don't know if many people have examined the concept of space. What is space? Space is, is an experience created by the ability of attention to experience near and there. If attention does not have the experience of near and there, there can be no space. And the ability of attention to be near and there arises out of time. If there is no time, you can't have here and there. Chronologically. Time creates this possibility of here and there. In fact, time creates this. Time alone creates space. Attention placed in time creates space. It's the attention, the capacity of human conscious attention to create a here and a there, which arises from time that creates space. So the three dimensions of space are a function of the dimension of time. Since we were studying from the other end, and Einstein came up with this, he was studying from the three-dimensional world, and he discovered that things are not there at all. He found nothing is there a second later where it was. 
there is nothing that exists over here nothing at all nothing at all underlying that exists after one second we record it second ago he said what is this i'm talking about i'm fixing the ordinate i'm telling where the things are i'm fixing the ordinate in relation relatively to other or other things i say this this table is so many feet above the earth but where is it in space the whole table the whole earth everything has moved by the time i said that it wasn't there it's moved how much it has moved we don't even know we have a proper measure at what pace we are expanding in the universe is not known to us we are hurtling through space perhaps at millions of miles per second right now and every moment i am speaking we are far away from where we were so when i stand this covered strange phenomenon because he was telling larger space not a space between the table and the and the earth when he began to study in the stellar space he discovered the things are not there how can i find out where it all is the moment they start measuring everything is moved away the galaxy is moving everything is moving nothing is there so he had to tell the new dimension of time he said i cannot say this is the ordinate of a particular object it's so high so far away so distant no he said i can only describe the ordinate of an object at a particular time and if the time has flown it's become an event of that time i can describe it to this second to this second what the ordinate were and time becomes an ordinate we need to use time as an ordinate of the space that was known earlier but then investigators went on to study stars planets galaxy and they found the nearest star itself was so far away the ordinary foot rule would not apply we can't measure so they introduced what was called the light year the distance that would be traveled by light traveling at 186000 miles a second in one year is the nearest star when he found that the nearest star takes a year then it dawned upon us oh if it takes a year for the nearest star and when we look up in the sky and say that's the nearest star what we are looking at is not the star but the star that was there a year ago and suddenly he found there is no way of looking at anything that is there now because even the nearest was a year ago the others are million years ago a billion years ago 10000 years ago and the second thing we found was we can't see the two stars together one is one year ago one is a million years ago we don't know that the one that is there million years ago still there or not we see both of them now what kind of space is this what kind of sky are we looking into this means when we say that thing is so far away we are really seeing that thing is so back away in the past what we are really saying is when we say that star is one light year away We are saying that star is one year in the past. Clear replacement of time for space. We cannot see what is at any place now in the present. Do you know? I can't see you where you are now because it takes time. Is this it? I can't see you, Tim and Bob Parker and uh, Professor Mueller standing out there at the same time because you are not there at the same time. Each is taking a different time. how it looks like so do the difference is this is taking the difference in the time is much shorter so we don't notice it and the principle is the same so what is creating the space itself is time the time mm-hmm. has created space three ordinates of space are being created by time so very interesting so it's come up now to new investigations after einstein said and they are investigating how einstein found that the only measurement can be made from the point of view of the observer if i am sitting on one planet and looking at it all time calculation starts from there supposing there is no observer <laughs> what is the dimension there is no dimension if this is so that there can be no dimension of time space without an observer to whom it must be related then the observer becomes the very creator of all dimension fits in beautifully with the concept of consciousness creation that object is conscious so when you say that you still have the space of this world this is because we are accepting the illusion living in a taking this real permanent doesn't change of course it's not there actually as time becomes available to attention it creates 